Lord, we pray for the word to be uh, preached, to be preached well, and to be preached in a way that uh, impacts our lives, um, impacts our hearts. We just pray that you are uh, with us today, that your Holy Spirit is here with us as we uh, go through your word. And we just pray that um, the word of God will be living and active as we go through it, and that it can just pierce our hearts, change the way that we behave, change the way that we act, and that it, um, we can just feel the, the love of God in these words, um, just understanding who Jesus is, what he did for us, and we just pray that you give us uh, wisdom and just uh, hearts to learn today as we go through the book of Hebrews. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, we are going to be starting in the book of Hebrews. I had a long... Uh, some debate with myself about what book I actually wanted to go through. Because if you didn't realize last year, we were going over a lot of the parables. Um, that was kind of my <coughs> series was the parables. But now we're actually going to go through a book of the Bible, and that is the book of Hebrews. And I have to be honest with you, I did not want to go through the book of Hebrews because it's a very challenging book in terms of what it teaches. Um, it's challenging in, in terms of uh, how we ought to behave. It's a very exhortational book that, that urges people to live uh, holy lives. And it's also difficult because of what it talks about. Is uh, It's a lot of the Old Testament, and a lot of us are not that familiar with the Old Testament, right? Um, because, you know, we... Uh, we just don't read our Bibles enough. <laughs> so I, I thought it would be challenging for, for me to, to teach through this book because of how much it references the Old Testament, that it's going to be hard for me to explain what the Old Testament parts are about while also explaining what the writer of Hebrews is going to be going over. So um, that's a challenge I'm willing to undertake, but I was a little um, nervous about going into it because I wanted to do something a little easier um, than this, maybe like a gospel or something like that. But here we are doing Hebrews because that's what the Holy Spirit really put on my heart to do. So today we are only going to be going over the first four verses. It's just going to be an introduction to the book of Hebrews, but I don't want you to get too nervous. We're going to be moving a lot faster after that. We're not going to take um, three or four years to go through this book um, if we did four verses at a time. So don't don't uh, lose your mind or anything. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about that. So the book of Hebrews, um, does anyone want to take a guess at um, who the book of Hebrews is addressed to? Muslim. No. Muslims. Jews. Yeah, Jews. Hebrews, right? You have the book of Romans that's uh, written to the Romans. You have the, the book of Galatians that's written to the church in Galatia. Um, but this one's written um, to the Hebrews. And that's all we really have uh, going for it. We don't actually know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but there's some guesses. Um, when you read the book of Hebrews, it kind of sounds a lot like Paul. It sounds a lot like Paul. But I don't think Paul wrote it, to be honest. I really don't. There's a lot of guesses to who wrote it, but all we can be sure of in this book is that Paul was around while it was being written. He influences it um, in big ways. You could see Pauline, they call it, the scholars call it Pauline features in the book. But Paul, I don't think, wrote it. Um, he was there while it was being written. But honestly, a lot of scholars think that this is an example of an early sermon, an early sermon. Because if you just read the book of Hebrews out loud, guess how long it would take? About as long as a sermon, about 45 minutes, a little bit less than 45 <laughs> minutes. So um, we could just read it and then you would hear it. But uh, the things, like you said, the things that you uh, hear, you might not understand because it is very deep theologically. And that's another feature of the book of Hebrews is the Greek that it's written in is like, masterful. Um, Greek scholars read it and they're just like, whoever wrote this book, they knew Greek better than anyone. And they also knew the Old Testament in Greek. Do you know what the Old Testament uh, Greek translation is called? Hebrew? No. <laughs> Septump something, yeah. Septuagint. The Septuagint. Um, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And whoever wrote this almost always quotes from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew version. Because Everyone at the time, they, they spoke Greek, right? And not many people spoke Hebrew. So he figured, hey, if everyone speaks Greek, I should make my thing in Greek so that people can actually understand it, which is very smart, very smart guy. So um, whatever, whoever the author is, he's, he's masterful at Greek, and he's also a masterful uh, user of the Old Testament. He knows it really, really well. He quotes it like crazy, um, and he makes really good uh, parallels to Christ in it. Now, what's the purpose of the book? Um, it's written to the Hebrew people, right? Now, this book was written in about uh, before 70 AD, okay, before 70 AD, which is really important um, because before 70 AD, what what happened in 70 AD? We talk about it somewhat often. What happened, Joseph? 
the temple was destroyed. Now, this is one of the rare cases where uh, scholars, both secular and Christian scholars, agree on the date of Hebrew, as it's before 70 AD. And the only reason why they say that is because the author of Hebrew talks about the temple like it's still there. Like it's still there, that sacrifices are still going on. But um, when we're reading it, the temple's not there. So that's how they kind of know, hey— this was written before that, and we also have one of the church fathers, his name's Clement of Rome, who wrote in 100 AD, who quotes Hebrews. So it's at least before 100, but most say before 70. Now, the purpose of Hebrews, again, there was a big challenge for Jewish people who converted uh, to Christianity early on. If you didn't know, the majority of early converts were actually Jewish, but then after the first century, almost none of the converts were Jewish, okay? Almost none, um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason really comes back to the societal pressures that the Jews were under. Um, After Jesus died and was crucified, there was a lot of hostility towards his followers by the religious leaders, by the Pharisees, because they killed Jesus and the Christians weren't exactly thrilled about that, Um, even though it had to happen. They knew, uh, you know, all that stuff. But there was a lot of hostility there. And a lot of the Christians were actually being kicked out of the temple. They weren't allowed to go in and worship. If you don't know, that's actually why we have our Sabbath on Sunday, not Saturday. The Jews went and worshipped in the temple on Saturday. Christians do it on Sunday. Um, it's because of that. It goes all the way back to that. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage the Jewish um, Christians, we might call them Messianic Jews, to not go back to Judaism. Because all they would have to do to get accepted back into the temple is just say, Jesus isn't the Messiah. And then they're allowed to go back in and worship, right? It's that easy. It's that simple. So there might have been a lot of temptations, right, to go back, to to return to the old way of doing things um, that would allow them to be worshiping with their friends and their families who might not be Christian, right? There's a lot of pressure. And and the best example I could think of this is when I was a, a missionary in the Philippines, right, a lot of Muslims in the area that we were in, if any of those Muslims converted to Christianity, it was a big <coughs> big deal. It was a big deal because they would be kicked out of their family, basically. And in Islam, it's called committing shirk, which is to say that Allah isn't, isn't who I want to follow anymore. That's, it's like a death penalty. It's literally a death penalty. In Islamic nations, if you renounce your religion, they will kill you. That's just how it is. Um, and that was why it's such a big deal. Now, in the Philippines, they don't have an Islamic government, so they couldn't enforce the death penalty. But there were many instances of fathers trying to kill their own children who tried to convert to uh, Christianity. So it's a big deal. And that's kind of what exactly was happening at this time. Because if you don't know, the religious leaders of the time started to put Christians in prison. They started to kill them. Paul, who might have been part of writing Hebrews was one of those people, right? He initially was killing and persecuting the church, but eventually he converted. So this is who the author is writing to, this persecuted um, people. But the author is going to make it very clear that Jesus is the way. He is far superior, far better, greater than everything that Judaism is. In every possible way. That's what the book of Hebrews is. He's going to hit on just about everything that Jews rely on in their religion of Judaism. He's going to hit them all. And he's going to say that Jesus is better. And here's why. Jesus is better. And here's a proof in the Old Testament for why. Right? He's going to go through and systematically, systematically hit every single thing that they rely on. Okay, so here's here's a summary of the things that he's going to say. Just just when we go through it, just always pay pay attention to the word better, greater than, and superior to, because it's all over the all over the book of Hebrews. So initially, he's going to say that Jesus is superior to the prophets, all of the prophets. This huge section of the Bible, he's better than all of it. Okay, that's the first one. The next one is he's better than the angels, which is a big deal. We'll get there in the sermon. He's better than Moses. Who was Moses? Guy who split a sea in half, yeah, right? <laughs> that's good. It was the Red Sea, yeah, exactly. Moses is the one who brought them out of Egypt and gave them the law, and gave them the law. He's a big deal. Like Moses is the big guy on the block. He's better than that. He's better than Aaron. Aaron is the high priest who is in charge of making the sacrifices for the sins of the people. He's better than Joshua, not me. Joshua in the Bible. He's better uh, than Joshua. Joshua is the one who led them into the Promised Land after Moses died. He's better than everything in Judaism. He's better than all of their traditions. He's better than the old covenant. 
The Old Covenant is like everything in the Old Testament. He's better than all of it. He's better than all of the Old Testament saints. He's better than Abraham. He's better than, than Isaac and Jacob. He's better than all of them. All of them. And he is better than um, pretty much everything in the Old Testament. That's just what we're getting at. All right. And he's going to make the point that the things in the Old Testament aren't bad. They're not bad, but they're not complete. They're not perfect. And this was actually a messianic expectation of the time that the new, that the Messiah who would come would give a new Torah, a new law, just like Moses did. Moses gave the law. Well, they thought that the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, he'll give us a more complete and perfect law. And that is what Jesus said that he was doing, right? He said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Okay. So. That is what he's going to be pointing at here. And he says that the, the things in the Old Testament, like the tabernacle, those are just shadows. They, they're like, when you look through the fog and you can see like an outline of something, they're just a shadow of the reality that's in heaven. Just a shadow. But the writer of Hebrews is going to say that Jesus is the full picture. You can see everything in Jesus. So, very big deal. Another thing is he's going to say that Jesus is a, is better than the angels. He's going to say that he's a better hope, a better covenant with better promises, better sacrifice, better substance, and better resurrection. These are all really important things, and we'll get there when we go through the book. But again, just remember that this is all written to converts to Christianity. It's all written to converts to Christianity. And when they were being kicked out of the temple and they were being tempted to go back to Judaism, to the old way of doing things— just just keep that in mind as, as we're going through. There's a, a quote from one of my favorite uh, scholars. His name's Arthur Pink. He, he writes this. Though deprived of the temple, he's talking about the Christians of this time. Though deprived of the temple with its priesthood, with the altar and sacrifice, the apostle who wrote Hebrews reminds the Hebrews that we have the real and substantial temple, the great high priest, the true altar, and the one sacrifice with all its offerings, the true access into the very presence of the most holy. So that's who Jesus is. And with all of that, uh, we have finally gotten through our introduction, and now we can actually open the Bible now that we're like 20 minutes into this. So if you want Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the book of Hebrews is close to the end of the Bible. Um, It's right here. Okay, so just flip to the end of your Bible, you'll find Hebrews. And we're going to just do verses 1 through 4. And the reason why we're only doing the first four is because these first four verses really do outline everything that he's going to be talking about in the entire uh, sermon or book of Hebrews here. Okay, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Every time I read that, it's just like, it's just like an explosion of like theology, honestly, because there's so much in these first four verses that it really does uh, warrant an entire sermon. Now, if you notice in first verse here, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. What's the author saying here about the prophets? He's not saying that the Old Testament is not inspired by God, right? He's saying that God spoke to them, right? All the stuff in the Old Testament, that's inspired by God. And he's going to go on later in the book of of Hebrews to say that all scripture, the whole Old Testament, is God-breathed and useful for teaching and and rebuking in righteousness, right? He says that it's important. We should read it. We should know it. And we should understand it. And we should apply it to our lives. But in verse 2, he says... But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. So he's going to say that the prophets, they spoke. But in these last days, if you don't know, we're in the last days right now. It might not feel like that because it's been 2000 years, but we're in the last days, I promise. Um, the, after Jesus, 
Now we're in the last days. Um, and in these last days, he's spoken to us by, by Jesus himself. So if you want to hear God talk to you, one of the best ways you can do it is by reading uh, the New Testament here, reading his word and applying it to your lives. Now, um, like we talked about, he's going to say that the old things are old and the new things are better. Jesus is better. Now, if you would uh, turn, actually, you don't have to turn with me, but I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 31 just to show you that there's an expectation here for, um, for a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to, the, to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. New, 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 right? New covenant. The old way is going to go away. Jeremiah wrote about it. He's, the prophets wrote about it, that there's a new thing coming, and that new thing is Jesus, the Messiah. Now, this always reminds me, whenever we talk about like the old way of doing things and the new thing, is if you guys don't know, I do a lot of painting, like a lot of um, painting, right? And when I first started painting, I used to buy the cheapest paintbrushes you could imagine, like dollar, two dollar paintbrushes, because I was like, they look the same, right? They look the same as the nice ones. I'll just use these. And I used them for like a year. Right. And then I was talking to a painter one time and, and he saw me at the paint store. Right. And he sees me buying these cheap brushes. He's like, do you do a lot of painting? And I'm like, yeah, I do. I paint all the time. It's like, why are you using those things? You, you got to like really invest in a good paintbrush. And I was like, ah, I mean, what does this guy know? Right. What is this guy? It's just throwing paint on a wall. Right. Who cares? Um, and he's like, no, no, trust me. Trust me. So I, I did. I bought like a twenty five dollar paintbrush. Right. Not that expensive, but whatever. <laughs> I bought it. And then I went to the job that I was doing and I started painting. And I, I just like felt like my heart was like melting. I was like, oh, this is so easy. Everything's so easy. The paint doesn't like fall over the floor. And stuff. This is so great. Why? What was I doing for a full year using these stupid paintbrushes that are like a dollar that I would use once and throw them in the trash? Like, what was I doing? What was I thinking? Right. And that's, uh, that is how it should feel for these, for the author of Hebrews. He's like, like, look, guys, you were doing the things the old way, the, the way that was insufficient, the way that wasn't so good. And now I'm giving you the better paintbrush, the, the better everything. It's better in every possible way. Why would you ever want to go back? You know, maybe for you Valorant players, you could say like, oh, when you, when you have like, you use like a crappy mouse, right? And it's like terrible and it's jumping all over the place. And then you get like a really nice mouse and you use it. And then you're able to flick headshots. And you're like, oh, wow, this new mouse is great right this new mouse is awesome right maybe you get like a really nice monitor that you have really good frame rates on right maybe that <laughs> that helps you understand but <laughs> that's exactly what the author here is doing he's he's trying to say that those old things that you guys used to do they're not good enough they're not good enough he's not saying they're bad he's just saying they're not good enough and that's important so uh, that's what he's basically saying about the old way. The old way of the prophets, it's just not enough. They, the prophets themselves were looking for something better. They were looking for something better. And you'll see that in, later in the book of Hebrews. Verse 2. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So who's this son guy, right? Who made the universe? Any guesses? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. God made the universe, right? So the author here is saying that the son made the universe. So we can make no mistake here in, in, in confusing that, that Jesus is God. Jesus is God, right? Because we were just in Philly the other day, weren't we? And me and Andrew, we went and talked to a certain group. Who was it, Andrew? Who was the group that we talked to? Yeah, the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses think about Jesus? Oh, yeah, that. They say he's not God, right? They say he's not God. They claim, they read the same book we do, right? Well, they have other stuff too. But they read the same book we do. Um, they have their own translation. Um, and they say that he's not God. And I, I remember, we went to Colossians chapter 1, right? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. 
I turned to Colossians chapter 1 with this guy, right? And we read verses 15 through verses 17, which says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And that's where he wanted to stop, right? Where it says firstborn of all creation. Because what does that imply? That Jesus might have been created. He's the first created being of all creation, right? But what he doesn't understand is that this firstborn language has nothing to do with creation. It has to do with inheritance. Because if you're the firstborn in a Jewish family, you get the most inheritance. And if you're the only son, then that means you get all the inheritance, right? So he inherits all things. And then verse 16 and 17 really hammer in what I wanted to read. For in him all things were created... Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I don't know how you can read that passage and and not come out of it thinking that Jesus is God. He is God. Now, let's go to uh, John chapter 1. Just to really hammer this point in, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was the life, and that life would become the light of all mankind. And that light would shine in the darkness, and the darkness would not overcome it. And then we could skip down to verse 14, and the word became flesh. So we learn who the word is. The word is Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So there could be no mistaking here, no mistaking who Jesus is, what part he took in creation. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to say here. He's trying to say, like, look, the prophets are good. But they're not the word of God. They are not the literal incarnate word of God who created all things. The prophets, they're great guys. They were used by God. God spoke through them. But they aren't Jesus himself. They aren't God himself in the flesh, the son of God um, who made the universe, right? Okay, verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory. Um, There's this funny word in Hebrew. It's called Shekinah. Shekinah. Do you know what Shekinah means? It's like... Basically what they're saying here, the radiance of God's glory, the Shekinah glory of God would be um, something that mankind couldn't exactly look at because it would be um, killing. It would be like murdering them, basically, um, to see this. This is like uh, when Moses came down from receiving the law and his face was glowing and everyone was like, hide your face. We can't look at it. You still have the glory of God shining from your face after everything happened. That's kind of what's being said here. It's like how you have the sun and the sun gives off light and heat, that would kind of be uh, the best description of what this um, actually means, okay? Um, And uh, what does it say? Oh, sustaining all things uh, by his powerful word. We just saw that in Colossians 1. It says that, um, and through his word, he holds all things together. It's the same thing um, that he's saying here. And that's why some people think that Paul wrote this because Paul wrote Colossians. Um, So it's a similar idea. Now, we get to the most important part. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in high. Purification for sins. How did Jesus provide purification for sins for us? How was it done in the Old Testament? How was sins purified in the Old Testament? Yeah. Sacrifice, right. In the temple, this is why it's such a big deal that they were getting kicked out of the temple. In the temple, every year, There was the Day of Atonement where they would sacrifice for the sins of the whole nation, for the whole nation, right? And if you weren't part of that, that would imply that your sins are not forgiven, right? And that's why it's such a big deal that the writer of Hebrews here is going to show later on, and right now he's just saying it, that Christ is the one who makes purification for sins. He's going to say that that old system of sacrificing day in and day out, first for the sins of the high priest and then for the sins of the whole nation. 
That old system is done away with. The new system, Jesus Christ, when, when Jesus Christ died on a cross, sacrificed his life, laid down his life for all of us, that sacrifice that he made is a sacrifice that's once for all. Once for all. It's one sacrifice for the sins of all people. And then what does it say afterwards? It says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He sat down. Okay? So... Let's say, uh, you know, you're, you're home from school and your dad comes home from work and he sits down on the couch. What is he doing? Drinking beer. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, when, when your, when your dad comes home and he sits down on the couch and he sits there, maybe he's got his beer or whatever. And he sits there and he goes, ah, what's he doing? Using yeah. WeChat. Using <laughs> WeChat. George, what what happens when you when you get home from work and you sit down on the couch? What what do you feel at that moment? Peace. What? Peace. Peace. Yeah, peace. Right. It's resting. Right. You get home from work. You just you know put it in Jesus's terms. Jesus just got back into heaven. Right after being on earth for those thirty years, where he had a pretty hard time. Right when Jesus was on earth, he didn't have the most fun time. He was serving people. Um, he was healing. He was doing all these crazy things. And then, I mean, at the end of it, he was getting crucified, which isn't so fun. Right. So after all of that, after all of that horrible stuff that happened to him, now he's in heaven and he sits down at the right hand of God. And, he's, and what does Jesus say, his last words on the cross, what does he say? It is finished. It's done. The work's done. I'm going to go sit next to my Father in heaven. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest. And this idea of resting, one sacrifice for the purification of all sins, may have sounded a, a little ridiculous to the Hebrews because they're like, look, we do a sacrifice every year. Every single year, because sins keep happening, right? But the, if, if you don't know, the temple's about to be destroyed. And what happens after the temple's destroyed? Who does the sacrifices? Where are they done? Nowhere. 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 There are no more sacrifices. So it's almost prophetic in a sense. Here, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is almost preemptively. It's like he almost knows that the temple's going to be destroyed. But there's no way to know that, right? He, the temple is about to be destroyed, and... And he's showing here, like, the purification for sins once for all. Once for all. That temple's about to go down, and then there won't be any more sacrifices, right? This sacrifice is the last one. It's the best one. It's the one that covers over the sins of all people for all time because it was the most important sacrifice. It was the Son of God being sacrificed. Crazy. Crazy. Verse 4. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is, is superior to theirs. When I first started reading Hebrews, um, if you don't know, the, the, the whole rest of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 is all about angels. And I always wondered, like, why is he going straight into angels, right? Because, you know, we uh, in America, our view of angels is a little funny, right? It's a little goofy. You know, you have movies that have angels in them. Have you guys ever seen It's a Wonderful Life? Yeah. No. no, it's a really old movie. I don't blame you if you haven't seen it. It's in black and white, really old. But my, my grandpa loves that movie. And every single Christmas, we have to watch It's a Wonderful Life with my grandpa. I got out of it this year because I have a baby, and we had to get home for, for him to go to sleep. So I got out of it for the first time in my entire – how old am I? 26? Uh, in my entire 26 years of life, this was the first year I got out of it. I know all the words to the movie. I know all of them. I, it's funny. Uh, Tatiana hasn't seen the movie either. And I was just like – I was like, oh, you know, It's a Wonderful Life life it has an angel in it maybe i could bring it up and then she's like well what's the movie about and how i realized i knew like every word and every scene of that movie because of how many times i've seen it and um in the movie i'll just explain it to you there's this guy his name is uh george bailey and uh george bailey um has a wonderful life. That's the whole point of the movie. He has a wonderful life. He doesn't know he has a wonderful life. He's going through a really hard time. He wants to kill himself. He's standing on a bridge and he's ready to jump into the water, the icy cold water. And while he's standing there looking over the edge, he's about to jump. And then someone else jumps in before him. And, and he's like, Oh, oh my gosh. And then he jumps in too to save the guy. And then later on, they're sitting in the bridge's toll booth, right? Um, and, and they're just sitting there and, and George Bailey asks him, he's like, so why'd you jump in? Why'd you jump into the icy cold water? And the, angel clarence um he doesn't know it's an angel yet but the the angel says oh I, I did it to save your life and george bailey's like to save my life i jumped in to save your life and clarence is like no 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 you were gonna jump in and kill yourself i know you were and he's like he's like hmm 
Yeah, okay, whatever. And then basically what ends up going on and happening is um, you guys know the story even though you haven't seen the movie, I promise, because everyone copies it. George Bailey wishes he had never been born. And then the angel is like, that's a good idea. Let's show him what the world would look like if he'd never been born, right? And you guys have probably seen like cartoons that have this exact story in it because everyone copies it. It's such a classic. And that's kind of what we think of like angels though. Clarence is kind of like a bumbling fool in the movie, but he's still an angel. Um, but usually when you think of angels, you think of movies. Have you guys seen Angels in the Outfield? Oh my gosh, it's such a stupid movie too. Um, it's a baseball movie, yeah. There's, um, it's the angels, the team, the angels, right? And the team, the angels, for some reason, God really likes the team, the angels. And they're really bad. They're terrible. Um, they have like a really bad team. And God's like, I'm going to get them to win the World Series. So the angels, and only like a little kid. I don't really remember the movie, but this little kid can see the angels. and Nobody else can. So there's this one scene that I remember really well because one of the angels shows up in it. And the angel is like a, a, a girl with like really long flowing hair. And her robes are golden and flowing. And this guy uh, is about to hit a home run. The ball's like flying out. Then the outfielder's like running to get it. The guy on the angels is going to get it. And he jumps and he doesn't jump nearly high enough. So the angel picks him up really high and he catches the ball and it drops him on the ground. He's like, how did I do that? And it was just like, it's a really stupid movie. But that's how a lot of people think of angels, right? That um, they're just kind of like these flowing beings that are just out there and sitting on clouds playing harps and all that stuff. And In reality, they're abominations. They're what? In reality, they're abominations. Some of them do look like abominations. We learned that in the book of Ezekiel when we did our Christmas tree toppers. But um, I, I, do, I, I remember the story that my old youth pastor told me, actually. I don't know if this is um, necessarily a true one, but he said that he broke down on the side of the road one time at night, and he like, just couldn't fix his car or whatever, and he prayed to God. He's like, God, I'm in the middle of nowhere. My car is broken down. Send someone to help me. And sure enough, like a couple minutes later, this like old, like hippie Volkswagen uh, van pulls up behind him and out of the car comes a guy dressed like Elvis. And this guy comes up and he's like, hey, you need any help? And Mike Joe is his name. You'll actually meet Joe. He'll come and preach this time uh, sometime this year. Joe comes out and he's just like, yeah, you know, my car's broken, whatever. If you want to take a look at it. And this Elvis guy um, opens the trunk and, you know, does whatever, fixes the car. And he's like, all right, start her up. And it starts. And then Joe's just like, it's like, how did you fix it? Like, how did you do it? And he's just like, oh, you know, I just know stuff about cars, you know, whatever. And then he's like, well, what's your name? What's your name? And the guy looks at him as he's getting into his car. He just says, Elvis. And he slams his car and drives away. <laughs> and then, like, whatever. And he says that's an angel. I don't know. But there's, <laughs> there's apparently a lot of stories like that about angels. I don't know if that's a real angel story, but... Um, just know that in their, in this time, in Jewish culture, right, angels are not something that's joked about, right? Angels are not these feminine things that just fly around and help people catch baseballs. They are much more important. They're much more important. They are very powerful beings. The, an angel is the one who delivered the law to Moses, right? The archangel Michael, who's battling with Satan, right? This, these angels are nothing to be trifled with. They're very powerful. And if you remember the angels that we saw in the book of Ezekiel, they're freaky, right? A lot of them are freaky. Not all angels um, look like that or all the same. But those angels, I mean, they're incomprehensible in the way that they look. Uh, just Google biblically accurate angels and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and they knew that angels were extremely powerful. And that's why the author of Hebrews, at the beginning of Hebrews, says Jesus is greater than your greatest beings, right? God's strongest beings that he created, the angels, Jesus is superior to them. The Son of God is superior to them. And that's why he's pointing to it. He took the most powerful thing that they had in their culture, besides God, and he said that, the son is, is stronger than them. He's better than them in every possible way. And then, as we said, he's going to systematically take apart everything from here. He starts with the angels. He describes who Jesus truly is. And then he goes on from there, taking apart everything. And all of the time, he's just saying over and over again, hey, don't go back because Jesus is greater than all of them. Now, I have to be honest with you. The book of Hebrews is very controversial. Very controversial with some of the things that it teaches. Um, in fact, one of my brothers, uh, we talked about Calvinism a little bit. Um, he's a Calvinist. He, he actually told me that, um, 
he thinks that the book of Hebrews shouldn't be in the Bible because of what it teaches. <laughs> I don't know if he still believes that. I hope he doesn't. But he did say that once, and um, I told him that he's crazy. Uh, but just so you know that there are some things in here that are very controversial, which pertain to um, salvation and uh, apostasy and stuff like that. But again, we'll get there. It's in uh, chapter 2. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. So remember that Christ is superior. And verse four again says, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. The name he has inherited. You know, um, the name is very important. The name of Jesus is very important. We might not think of it in any particular terms because nowadays, like, everyone believes in Jesus, right? You hear it all the time. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But if you ask a Jehovah's Witness, do you believe in Jesus? They'll say, absolutely. If you ask a Mormon, do you believe in Jesus? They'll say, yes, we do. But if you didn't know, Mormons believe that Jesus is an angel. And is Jesus an angel? No. He's superior to the angels. He was before all things were created, before the angels were created. He was before that. Um, and they believe that he's an angel. So just saying that you believe in Jesus nowadays might not hold the same weight as it did back then before all these crazy, uh, hokey things started popping up, right? Believing in the name of someone was not simply believing Jesus existed or, yeah, I believe that Jesus died on a cross. It's not that simple. Believing in the name of Jesus is believing in the character of Jesus, everything Jesus taught. And that's what it says. When, when I say, I believe in the name of Jesus, that should mean that I believe in everything Jesus did, all the things he taught. I, I submit to his teachings. That's what it should mean. I submit to the idea that, that Jesus did die on a cross for all sins for all people. And that when he died on a cross, that he rose again three days later, resurrected from the dead. And that after he resurrected from the dead, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, resting from his work of the purification for sins. That's what it should mean when you say that you believe in the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what he's saying here. So he became as much superior to the angel's um, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs, is superior to theirs. The angels are powerful, but Jesus's name is so much more powerful. And that's the lesson here. So um, I think that's all I have here for today. There's a lot that we're going to be going into um, in this book. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm very nervous about it. As Tatiana, I couldn't eat all day. I really did. I thought I was going to like throw up because I was like, I can't do this book. <laughs> it's, too, it's too much. So uh, with that, uh, let's just get ready for it for the next couple weeks here. Um, let's just pray. Dear God, uh, we thank you for the book of Hebrews. We thank you that, that you are superior. You are better. You are greater than everything that has come before you and that you are the greatest thing that we could ever uh, strive to obtain. That you are the son of God, the, the creator of the universe, the one who purifies sins, the one who laid down his life for the sins of the whole world. Um, we just pray that, that anyone here who has not uh, put their faith in you, that has not believed in the name of Jesus, that they would do that today, that they would put their faith in you, believe in you, be baptized into your name, to, to believe in the name of Jesus. We pray that that would happen and that we could take all of the encouragements, all the exhortations that come from the book of Hebrews and we can just apply them to our lives as we, as we move on, that we would not shrink back into anything, that we would not shrink back into atheism, that we would not shrink back into any other religion, religion, that we would just hold firm to the truth um, that Jesus Christ has died for our sins, and that if we believe in his name, then, then we will be saved, as your word says.